So as we continue the diocese's wish for us to think about the kerygma during Advent, if we were to sum up this week's readings into a word or two, we might see a progression in the readings. So they seem to start with joy. In the reading from Baruch, we hear about the glory and splendor of God, similar to last week's homily, and that God leads Israel in joy. And the responsorial psalm, The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. The reading from St. Paul to the Philippians begins the transition. So he starts with a prayer of joy, but then reminds the people of their need to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, which means free of sin. And finally, in the Gospel of Luke, we hear that John the Baptist was sent before Jesus to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah, to prepare the way of the Lord and make straight his paths for the salvation of God by baptizing the people for the forgiveness of sins. So clearly in Advent, we are called to repent of our sins and to be made whole for the coming of Christ and to do so with joy. Now this may seem contradictory, but it actually makes sense when we think about it from God's viewpoint. So let's start by thinking about sin and where it comes from. Now, over the years, I've heard a number of false claims about the Second Vatican Council. And one of the worst was that Vatican II got rid of sin. We no longer have to worry about sin. God loves us no matter what. And so I know many priests and bishops and others in the church refuse to talk about sin anymore. And as a result, most of the Catholics in my generation and the surrounding generations received a watered-down faith. We were told about Jesus, I call him hippie Jesus, and a God who loves us no matter what we do, which is true, but it left out the important part about him hating the sins that we do because they wound our relationships with him. This means that sometimes when we do talk about sin now, people flinch. Or they're uncomfortable. Can you talk about that? Why is he bringing that up? And unfortunately, popular culture doesn't help. We hear these themes in music, television, and movies. You're perfect as you are. Do whatever makes you feel good. Or my personal favorite, you do you. I fear that we have many generations now that have grown up feeling as though they can do whatever they want and there are no consequences for their actions. And I would argue that this is one reason, though not the only one, but one reason for increases in teenage violence, like school shootings and other evil acts. We as a culture need to return to the gospel message, repent, prepare the way of the Lord, and do so joyfully. The unfortunate truth is that sin and evil is a reality in our lives. Evil is real, and we all sin. The question often arises, why is there sin in the world? One of the biggest claims by atheists against the reality of God is, if God was really all-powerful and all-loving, why is there evil in the world? Now, this is a complicated question with complicated answers, but the most simple reality is that evil is present in the world because God loves us. Now, that may seem counterintuitive as well, but let me explain. God did not create evil, and he never wishes evil upon us, nor does he want us to sin, but he allows it to happen because he loves us. We have to consider, would it be better for us to live in a world that is free of evil and sin, but also free of freedom? Or is it better to live in a world where we have the freedom to choose our actions and therefore the ability to choose good and evil? God loves us so much that he has given us free will, the ability to choose good or evil. And since we are fallen, sometimes we freely choose to sin, to commit evil. But let's take one more step back. Where did evil come from in the first place? So this goes back to the beginning of creation. God created the angels, 
And one of the angels became full of pride. He knew of God's plan to create humanity and that the angels would serve humans. And remember last week I talked about how we are God's most precious creation. This angel pridefully refused to serve humans and thus to serve God. As the saying goes, pride comes before the fall. This is why pride is often called the root of all evil. His pride and his envy got in the way, and so he rejected God. And we typically call him the devil or Satan. When he rejected God out of his free will, his fall led to the entrance of evil and sin into the world. And of course, he brought us down with him through the temptation of Adam and Eve and their original sin, which has tainted humanity ever since. It's important to remember at this point that this is not the end of the story. God allowed it to happen, but he always has a plan. As St. Augustine pointed out, God can take even the greatest evil, the original fall of the devil, or the original sin of Adam and Eve, and make good out of it. In this case, as we are preparing to celebrate in a few weeks, God did not want humanity to be left without hope. God loved us so much that he gave us free will, but he also loved us so much that he sent his son into the world to redeem our sinfulness. We are called to prepare ourselves for the coming of the Lord, the one who came to save us. Now, I love this image from the prophet Isaiah. The winding roads shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Think of this as our life, which is filled with all kinds of obstacles due to sin. We are called to fill in the valleys, to make low the mountains and hills, and to make level the rugged and rough land. If we think of every valley, mountain, and rough patch as sin in our lives, we make all of it level by being reconciled with God in the sacrament of confession. It is an act of humility to recognize our faults and atone for them. And humility is, of course, the antidote to the sin of pride, which started all of these problems to begin with. This is how we prepare the way of the Lord and make straight his paths. Now, last week I mentioned that all Catholics must go to confession at least once a year, according to canon law. And of course, we are strongly suggested to take part in the sacrament more often, as our own Bishop Hying recommends. It's even more dire if we commit mortal sin, or if we commit moral, mortal sin, we are For if we commit mortal sin, we are obliged to go to confession before receiving our Lord in the Eucharist. As St. Paul says in his first letter to the Corinthians, those who receive the Eucharist unworthily will have to answer for it, and that they bring judgment, condemnation upon themselves. Because if we truly understand and believe the Eucharist is God himself, we have to be free of sin in order to receive him. Now, these recommendations and requirements are for our good. They are not meant to be a punishment, but rather a freeing from the shackles of sin to bring us joy. Now, you may know that St. Paul especially refers to sin as our slavery. We become slaves to sin. Think about it. Once we get hooked on a particular sin, it's, we're significantly more prone to continue to give in to that sin. We even become addicted to sins. This is the devil working on us. He knows what our weaknesses are, and he uses them to try to make us fall over and over again. The sacrament of reconciliation is the best way to free ourselves of the slavery and to fill our hearts with joy. God gives us this beautiful gift. We only need to take advantage of it. The reality is we are placed in the middle of a war between good and evil. The forces at war are beyond anything we can handle on our own. We need to do our part, but we also need the ever more powerful assistance of God in our lives. 
We need to be willing to embrace humility rather than pride, to make straight the path in the desert, and to prepare the way of the Lord joyfully. We are given this season of Advent to do just that. At this Mass, we can place our struggles and our sins before God and ask for his forgiveness and for his help to free us from the slavery to sin. He loves us. He wants to help us. May we all do our part to joyfully rid our lives of sin so that we may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God.